Uh, the Whips have agreed that paragraphs 5 and 1 of Executive Report number 3 will be, will be debated next. Uh, so I now call upon the Leader to move reception of that report, uh, the motion to which is subject to two amendments. Uh, I move, uh, formally report, move report number three, Mr. Mayor, and happy to start the debate at your convenience. No, because uh, we need to discuss the amendments. Uh, the amendments proposed to paragraphs five and one uh, are required by the standing orders to be dealt with on reception of the report. With the Council's agreement, I propose that these amendments be debated in conjunction with the paragraphs to which they relate. Could I now ask Councillors Osborne and Mrs. Leone Cooper to move and second the first of those amendments, which relates to paragraph five, dealing with the streamlining of uh, the organization of the Council's business. Formally, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to formally second the... Thank you. Could I also call upon Councillor Senior to move paragraph five? And we will move into the debate with Councillor Locker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As was set out in the paper presented to the Finance and Corporate Resources OSC last week, the Council has made good progress in achieving the spending reductions required by the Government's last strategic spending review. However, it is clear the enormous task of rebalancing public spending in the UK necessitates further effort at all levels of government. And although we may disagree about who is to blame for the precarious state of the nation's finances, I would hope we all appreciate the ramifications it has on the decisions we face here in Wandsworth. With that in mind, it is vital that the Council continues to strive for the delivery of effective services which provide value for money for our residents. Over the last three years, we have sought to do that by reducing back office and administrative costs whilst limiting the impact on frontline services. The committee was reminded that market testing and tendering have already made a significant contribution to that objective. The case of tendering library services, for instance, has helped us keep all of our libraries open, whilst at the same time allowing for £6 million of savings to council taxpayers over the lifetime of the contract, a model that contrasts with the cut-and-run approach adopted by some local authorities. Streamlining our organisational structure clearly presents fresh opportunities for more back office savings. And to be honest, irrespective of the financial climate, I think it makes sense always to ask ourselves if we can do things more efficiently. Consequently, I believe the proposal to centralise support functions like HR and IT, along with reducing the number of council departments from six to four, is both necessary and desirable. The truth is, most of our residents are not concerned about how many departments there are at the town hall. Indeed, if anything, too many departments and an overly complex structure risks people being passed around, repeat handling of queries, confusion and frustration. What matters to local people is that the council is easy to deal with and delivers good customer service. So if anything, the proposed reorganisation will give us a chance to consider how to simplify the way we interact with residents. As well as merging departments, we should look to break down organisational silos to provide residents with a single, seamless customer journey. I hope that we can utilise technology and reconfigure our processes to achieve this. In future, we should make it far easier for someone to, say, report an issue on their estate switch their council tax to monthly direct debit and order new orange sacks all in one go. Streamlining the departmental structure of the council also gives us the chance to review our property estate. The committee paper makes sensible recommendations for reducing the council's requirements for office space. Moreover, as one of my opposition colleagues quite rightly pointed out, by looking at new ways of staff working, such as flexible and home working, we should realise increased productivity and further reductions in our overhead costs. Such changes are often popular with employees themselves and can improve work-life balance. Of course, managing change in any organisation presents challenges and risks. It can be unsettling and distracting for staff members who are already working hard to provide good quality services to local people. Nevertheless, I am confident that with the leadership of senior officers 
and professionalism of everyone who works at Wandsworth, we can successfully restructure the organization of the council to meet the demands of the current financial climate, whilst at the same time keeping customer service at the forefront of all we do. Delaying the proposals as suggested in the opposition amendment will only serve to prolong the uncertainty for staff and jeopardize the amount of savings that back office reorganisa reorganization will bring to the council. I, for one, do not believe obfuscation to be in anyone's interest. And listening to the opposition speakers in the earlier debate, I think deep down they agree with me. I therefore urge all of my colleagues to vote in support of the original recommendations as we did in the committee meeting. Thank you. Councillor Belton. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I first of all congratulate Councillor Locker? I thought that was a good speech and uh, said from his perspective the right kind of things. Um, but I don't think it faces the reality of the position we're in. And let me try and explain why. I actually don't believe, in all honesty, that um, the debate is much about uh, the clauses A to whatever it is. Um, I would hate to be in control of a Labour group right now, having to, do, having to respond to the impositions this government's placing upon us. That is the ruling Labour group. Actually, to make the kind of cuts that are being opposed generally would be terribly difficult. So I don't think it's an easy task. Uh, but could I just say in passing that I've seen, been around long enough to see these fashions come and go. We've gone, both parties, for centralization of back office services. We've gone for decentralization and taking it closer to the people. We've wanted a, a, a director for every service you can think of, both nationally and, uh, and locally. People say, oh, we must have a housing director. Oh, we must have a social services director. Oh, we must have a children's director. That was the last Labour government, that one all kinds of directors about real services because there are real services and really different functions. Perhaps where this council has gone wrong is having not only so many directors, but with due respects to all those people sitting around here who I quite respect and admire, paying them three times the rate. We could look at it another way and have uh, uh, senior people in charge of uh, uh, these functions on much lower salaries. But that's not really the issue. The real issue is the £20 million cut in this grant settlement coming next year and the £80 million, whatever figure it has been in the past. And I think the, the real issue has to be faced. The real issue is a council making these cuts, should they be lobbying the government for change or should they just be supporting the government? And this council is just supporting it. You can see by Councillor Govindia's astonishing uh, rehash of blaming the last Labour government that comes up all the time. And that's the real critical issue. And I wonder why. And I think there are two reasons. One is that there are a proportion of the Tory party. Um, obviously, uh, ex-councillor Choke would be an, is an example. But after the Eastley by-election, it would seem that whole lot, loads of other right-wing uh, uh, Tory MPs want bigger cuts. Actually, what they're against is public sector services completely. Now, that may not be true of all of you. Some of you are quite proud. I'm sure Councillor Tracy is proud of what the education service does. But some genuinely want to cut all public, or not all, but a very large number of public services. And that's what's behind this, uh, to my view. And that is what, as a society, we have to tackle. Now, I mean that very seriously, and I can quote you. Um, it, he wasn't, didn't say it privately to me, but Council Lister said, just after the 2010 election, regardless of the economic services, he thought that local government services should be cut substantially. What was a heaven-sent opportunity to the Tory party was to be faced with the economic collapse and electoral victory, and you blame economic collapse on the Labour government. Now, we all know that that is nonsense. We all know it's an international financial crisis, and Gordon Brown, however much I respect him, or Alistair Darling, was not responsible for Greece, Spain, Italy, you name it. 
What was responsible was irresponsible behaviour by bankers across the world, and that is at the root cause of it. And it is ridiculous pretending otherwise. So the whole fundamental issue is the Tory party's belief in this being the way to resolve it. And this is where I'm afraid I have to disagree with Councillor Carpenter, who says he doesn't want to look back in history, want to move forward. It is fundamental that the Tory party has to be tackled on this issue and get their analysis right. Because if they don't, with an economy that is collapsing, with living standards that are falling, with no recovery, a triple dip recession on its way, unless there's a 0.1% growth, 0.1% growth this quarter, what a joke. I mean, it's a triple dip recession, whether there's a 0.1% growth or not. And that is what's happening. And if they fail, then what is, I'm just winding up, if they fail, what is Osborne going to do? He has two possible tactics and only two. One is to go in full reverse, and do something to expand the economy, and where would he push that? He'll put in public services. Or the other is to cut further, and we'll have another round of cuts, yet deeper than the ones we're facing. It is up to you to challenge your party and get this sorted, because there's nothing I'm afraid anyone else can do. Councillor Mrs Clay. Thank you, Mr Mayor. When money is tight, we all look to ways of making what little we've got go further. Whether it's switching to a supermarket's own brand of loo roll, checking out car insurance websites. Sorry, I'm really lowering the tone here, aren't I? After <laughs> anyway, checking out car insurance websites, comparing interest rates on credit cards or on bank accounts. We're looking after the pennies because we know that's the way to make the pounds go further. When we're spending taxpayers' money, we have an absolute duty to make sure we're spending it wisely. I can't imagine that anybody other than the opposition believes that it doesn't matter if the council pays more for services than it needs to. We've spent nearly 35 years making sure we get best value, and one of the key ways we've done, done this is by seeing if an outside contractor can do the same thing for less. So far, this process saves us well over £60 million every year. I must admit, I find it slightly depressing that it's been true, proved true on so many occasions that the private sector can provide the same service cheaper than the public sector can do it. That might be depressing, but it's truly horrifying that the opposition's amendment tonight is calling for a halt to further market testing. On second thoughts, though, it's not surprising. For 13 years, the Labour government showed the same cavalier attitude to spending taxpayers' money. They've tried very hard to convince us that we can spend our way out of difficulty, something which your average man on the Clapham omnibus instinctively knows is wrong. I hope that this further exploration of market testing our services is more nuanced than it might have been, sometimes been in the past. There are challenges where markets aren't mature. Simply packaging up what we already do and contracting it out to the lowest bidder might well save money, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're getting best value for every precious pound. Before we write our tender documents, we must ask ourselves some crucial questions. Firstly, does the council actually need to provide something, or is it already provided by private companies, charities, the NHS, by central government, or by any other agency? Secondly, is there duplication across different council departments? Thirdly, and most importantly, is there concrete evidence that what we do is effective? Take, for example, physical exercise. We can all agree that this is a good thing, and anybody who hasn't had their head in a bucket for the last 20 years knows that most of us should probably do more. But are we certain which of the bewildering range of initiatives on the council's website actually work? How many parents ditch their cars for the school run because of our walk once a week scheme? That's called WOW. There's also National Walk to School Week and there's International Walk to School Month. A child told, told me yesterday when I asked him what he thought that meant that he said foreigners have to walk. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at my own joke. Oh, it was very funny. Um, <laughs> but how 
Perhaps the sight of so much of our playgrounds given over to staff car parking makes parents and pupils think this is a case of do as I say, not as I do. We already have an enviable array of sports and leisure facilities in Wandsworth. Do we know how many couch potatoes leap into action because of something the sports development team have done? Or are we just facilitating activity for the already sporty? With the proviso that a review of council activities precedes any further market testing, I'm wholeheartedly in favour of the leaders', leaders proposals. They're bold and forward-looking. They will save council taxpayers money. There may be risks, but there are also opportunities for our imaginative officers to look at different, more effective ways of doing things. And I was pleased the opposition members initially voted in favour of the recommendations to committee. It appears they've now had a change of heart and retreated into the past, resisting modernization, market testing, and streamlining. I urge you to reject their backward-looking amendment. Councillor Leonie Cooper. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Belton has uh, contributed to this debate by asking us to consider some of the larger and wider matters that lie behind it. And to me, the two elements of this debate that are most uh, noticeable are the whole area of the way in which we fund our public services and also whether or not we value our public services. And I don't just mean at national level, I also mean locally. Because one of the things that has been the watchword um, of the party opposite has been having the unique selling point, the USP of low council tax. Now, for some considerable period, we've been able to uh, see that happen in this council, partly uh, because of the damping grant, um, but also because uh, from soon after the low council tax regime was introduced, a Labour government was elected. And so we have managed, uh, with some assistance from that government, to provide a low council tax and still continue to provide quite a wide range of services. However, in 2010, and I would disagree with Councillor Belton, I would not say that the party opposite won the election, because they didn't. They're only um, governing with the support of the Liberal Democrats. It's actually a minority government. But within the cabinet, there is uh, our dear friend, Eric Pickles, who clearly dislikes local government quite intensely because he was the person who jumped on the bandwagon, and I'm not going to follow Councillor Daly with my um, Yorkshire accent because it's uh, worse than his, um, fr frank frankly. <laughs> um, he was the person who jumped on the bandwagon before almost anyone else in the cabinet of saying, yes, I agree to lots and lots of cuts to local government expenditure. And the fact of the matter is, is that we now have a central government that has the same position as the party opposite running this council, which is that taxes should be low, therefore the amount of money to fund public services is low. So then we're in a position where there is no money from central government, nothing to do with the Labour government at all. These are political choices that have been made. And we're now focusing in on the services that we provide. And yes, we do provide street cleaning. Yes, we do provide street lamps. Yes, we do collect rubbish and we do collect some recycling in some not very good <laughs> orange sacks soon to be replaced by much better clear ones. But there are a number of other services that we provide as well for elderly and vulnerable people and we have an ever-aging population and also children's services. So for those of us on this side, uh, and there are a number of us um, who have worked in local government, uh, which is probably slightly more uh, frequent on this side than it is on uh, the other side, on your side. Uh, the number of us who have quite a good knowledge um, of uh, the organisational structures of other councils, as well as this one. I had a privilege of working for a number of other authorities and in a number of other local authority areas, as well as knowing members in a number of other authorities across the whole of the country. And since becoming a member here, I, as well as a number of my other colleagues, have taken the opportunity to submit members' inquiries to improve my understanding of the details of our expenditure in this council. And as a result of this knowledge and experience, we on this side bring to the issue of streamlining 
quite a detailed knowledge. And it is for some time that we have been arguing that the number of departments should have been reduced. I found it quite astonishing when I became a school governor to discover that education had their own uh, team of HR staff. Um, such matters, however, have been postponed over a number of years, and we now do see something that is trying to push through very rapid change, possibly because we have a new chief executive, possibly because we've had a change of leader. So I would commend our amendment, which brings both a focus on change, which is as a result of both central and local governments, I would say dislike of providing a full range of services, um, but it also proposes it in a measured way. Thank you. Councillor Osborne. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to uh, address three elements of our amendment. Uh, the first is our uh, desire to take out the line which calls for us to agree a program of priority areas for market testing. Uh, do not take that to mean that we are universally opposed to all market testing or all outsourcing. Our problem with it in, in, this, uh, in this paper and the documentation is uh, you get the feeling from the way it's uh, uh, drafted that we are gung-ho about market testing and hardly anything else. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about internal reorganization, granted, but there's only a nodding reference to things like shared services and to um, uh, social enterprise. Let me illustrate the point a little bit on, on uh, how we feel on this. Uh, if I've allowed a moment of parochialism, Opposite Tooting Broadway tube station, there is now a bank and a pub and some other establishments where once there stood a municipal baths. The council provided baths for the public in this borough well into the 20th century because people did not have baths in their homes. It was an essential service for many. They were lucky some of them, if they had a tin bath, they could fill with hot water in their scullery. But then things changed. Then th people started to get baths in their homes. It wasn't essential anymore for a council to provide public baths. If I'm allowed an anachronism and stretching the point a little bit, somewhere along the line, someone decided to market test that public baths and outsource it, I suppose, to the builders and B&Q and everybody else who now provides baths in people's homes. Today, we have public libraries where people can go and get access to the internet if they don't have it at home. But one day, we'll reach a stage where everyone has the internet on some device somewhere in their pocket. It'll be very cheap indeed. We won't need to provide that service publicly. Although there might well be some other, something else, some other high-tech service of the far future as yet undreamed of, which people can't afford, but we'll have to do it as a council. And it will be right for us to do it as a council. And the point I'm making is society, technology, okay, there's an ideological disagreement, I think, between the majority party and the minority party about degree over how much is outsourced and how much is kept in the public sector. But there are other factors at play. And we all have to assess where we are, and we all have to take decisions from time to time about what kind of system we're going to use and whether something's being provided publicly or privately. And I think what we want is our foot on the brake on this thing about agreeing a program of priority areas for market testing. That's not to say that we rule it out completely, and in fact there are other clauses in the, that we are leaving in the, in, the, uh, in the document that would allow for some. But we don't want to be gung-ho about it, in particular because actually we think shared services with other boroughs would be a, an extremely <coughs> sensible way of cutting back on our costs. Uh, there's a nodding reference to it in the documentation so far, but I think that takes me on to something else. We can learn lessons. I think we've learned a bit of a lesson actually by working with Croydon on the library tender. I can't find anybody now who agrees that Croydon was a perfect fit for this borough. It was maybe 
a bit of a mistake to go in with them. On the other hand, the council leader has been very complimentary in this council chamber about the joint work he's doing with Lambeth at Nine Elms. I think we need to keep our foot on the brake on some of this stuff and experiment and examine a little bit more, which is why we're against a headlong rush into April. Start if you want, but let's not go to every committee with a report on everything on this. There are lessons to be learned from all our out outsourcing and all our contracts. Finally, one last point on all this, and let me too commend Councillor Locker for his eloquent intervention. He said, we, uh, we may disagree about the cause of the crisis, but we all agree on the seriousness of it. And I think one of the things that's disturbed us about the documentation is, yet again, this stuff about the, what the Labour government did or did not do. Okay, we disagree on it. We have put an alternative argument eloquently here, both uh, Councillor Belton and Councillor Cooper. But the fact of the matter is this. There is a raging fire. We need to join the team that's trying to put it out. We should not be arguing about what caused the fire. We have to decide as a council what is the best way to allocate reduced resources. And that is what we should be focused on. This sideswipe, this political, party political yabu politics all the time, okay, it may fit in here. But those members of the public that are watching, and there's not very many of them, I guess, <laughs> but any of them that take an interest in what we do. Could we wrap up, the, please? Yes. They will recognise that that cut side of the debate casts a shadow over what we do. Not for you, the majority party, not for us as an opposition, but for the public. And I think we have a duty to the public to put all that aside and try and push through some sensible proposals. And that's what our amendment does. No. Councillor Govindia. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I am a little surprised that we're debating it tonight. And I'm also a little surprised at the Labour contributions because I think uh, that shows exactly why this rather brief, rather stark, rather bold paper, fairly simply written and very easily understood paper, was approved and agreed by FCROSS members, uh, opposite members, uh, opposition members at the FCROSS committee. They approved it, they welcomed it, and I was surprised that it was going to be debated. I'm surprised that they've decided to amend it, because what has happened is that between FCROSS and the council, they've had a debate. And I guess, Councillor Carpenter got mugged on his way from F Cross to the Council. What the paper sets out is that we have a savings target of 20 million on top of what we are currently saving. The 2015 spending review is unlikely to be anything other than more of the same. And these proposals are designed to deliver those 20 million early if we can and to be in a good position to respond if there is a further challenge in the 2015 spending review. These proposals build on our recognized strength and strength that opposition recognized too, of very successful and immensely successful record of market testing our services. The latest example was the library tendering service, which I know Councillor Daly at FCROSS thought was in significant savings were being produced, but over seven million pounds over a contract period is not insignificant. And I have great hopes that further market testing will deliver the savings. And of course, what market testing will do, and, and you know, Councillor Clay was uh, suggesting that there may be a should be a review before we go to market. Well, indeed, there will be. Writing of the specification effectively starts the review of what we do, whether we should do it, whether the way we're doing it is the right way or not. But I am convinced that exposing current services to further rigors of market testing will provide us services without necessarily having to stop providing services. I, I don't discount staff mutuals and I don't discount working with other local authorities. In fact, earlier I mentioned, to gave two examples, and I know officers are in constant dialogue with other authorities about joint service providing. But what is important is that we should provide services jointly with a borough that has some synthesis with us. And perhaps, you know, the Croydon example will have to, uh, for us to learn from, and maybe we will. But it, it is important 
that we should go with a lo local authority that lifts us up rather than drags us down. And if there is one that can do it, I am perfectly happy to do so. And I have no difficulty in, in, in doing it. And of course, you know, going to bed on pension administration with Camden, a totally different political persuasion, didn't really matter to us because the deal was right, as it were. I propose that the council builds on the success of centralization as well. The centralization, I know, you know Council Bolton's right that you know, there, there are fashions, they come and they go. But sex, centralization so far has provided enormous savings and efficiencies. And I think there are further savings to be, to be garnered from further centralization. The merge of DTS and DOLAS has provided savings. And it was nonetheless a rather quickly driven merger. But I believe that, in fact, looking at the four remaining service departments and creating two new departments, two completely new departments out, out of four, would provide us both services, make this council lean, keen, and, and, and you know, ready for, for the challenges ahead. And in future, I don't discount looking afresh at admin and finance and see whether those two could, in fact, become a single unit. But I think time for that is not now, because when you've got four departments in flux and enormous amount of market testing being done, that somebody at the center needs to hold the ring and to hold the process in check. And that is why I think it would be reckless to throw them into the pot at this stage, which is why this site is, is not going to be reckless. I think the other thing I'd say is a sort of amusing point about the tooting bards. Um, I recall, certainly I was not in this council, but I recall the debate in the papers that the bards were, uh, the closure was greatly resisted by the party opposite, and I'm sure Councillor Heaster will have the memory that that closure was challenged by the party opposite because they still felt that there was somebody without a bathroom B and Q. That is not to say that if libraries become defunct in the future because of technological advances that we will still carry on running a library service even if people don't go to it. Well, of course, if change comes, we won't want to embrace it. But I think that the departmental structure that we are looking at is a structure that will be able to, to, to grasp the challenges that come, come in the future if they do. I think, Mr. Mayor, what we are embarked on is a review of our own systems and our ways of doing things without necessarily reducing service levels. We think that this, this proposal here will start a process of looking at ourselves, will review what we provide, will drill down on what we do better or what we don't do better, what we can do better with somebody else or what the private sector can do better for us. At the same time, we should be able to say to our residents that you, we are providing you service, uh, le levels of service at a price that you can afford. And Thank of course, you. members will have a part, role to play in, in every time the papers go back to FCROSS because, or, or to OSCs, because this is only starting the process. This is not the conclusion of the process. So it is uh, a bit leader, wrong to see. Leader, could I ask you to I, wrap I up, will please. wind up, Ms. Mayor. I, it is wrong to assume that this is a done deal and this is the end of the matter. Members will continue to have a role, and which is why I welcome the kind of uh, cautionary approach which Councillor um, uh, Osborne says, which would be like, make me chaste, but not yet. Well, we think that you will have time to be chaste, and you will have the opportunity to do so. Mr. Mayor, I commend the pap my paper and reject the opposition amendment. The matter now before the Council is that the amendment proposed by Councillor Osborne and seconded by Councillor Leonie Cooper concerning the streamlining of the organisation of Council business as tabled at this meeting be approved. Would you please indicate by a show of hands those votes in favour of the amendment? And those against the amendment? and those abstaining. Uh, the result of the voting then is 13 votes for the amendment, 36 against, nobody abstaining. The amendment therefore is lost. 
Could I? We need this. Oh, yes. So, can I propose then that we receive paragraph five as uh, information, same numbers? Thank you.